So there's a general problem that we have at the moment, which is that we've gone from a world of desktop machines and applications running on the desktop to everything running in the cloud. Um, and this has brought a lot of benefits, but there's a couple really, really big issues that have been coming up as a result of this merge. Like a while ago, we, when we used to run programs just merely on our computers, the way an application would work is that your computer would have some files. Um, so like, you know, on my Mac, it's got little folders and it's got a folder for, uh, it's called library. And library has a whole bunch of stuff in it, including library application support that has all sorts of, this, all sorts of settings for different applications are running. It's also got, obviously, the actual data itself. So this document that I'm drawing into here would, you know, will eventually sit as a file on my hard disk. Um, so there's my, like, content data as well. It includes regular documents, as well as things like calendar entries, uh, cal, um, calendar and everything else like that. Um, and this is really great, because this is my, my computer. And my computer can run whatever programs and whatever files I want. So all of this stuff sits on a hard disk that I own. Um, and that hard disk is something inside my computer, and I can control it, and I can move it anywhere I want. If I want to like migrate all my files to a new computer, like let's say I get some big clunky desktop machine, which spins up and uses lots of power, I can take all those files and I can drop them in here. And now if I fire up the same calendar application, whatever it else it is, you know, with some weeks and months, my appointments will all still exist in here. So this way I can move all my files between multiple computers if I own them. Um, and this is really, really great for like control in a sense. I've got my own computer or my own computers and I'm in charge of my own data. So my data will move around however I like. Um, and I can back it up. I can, I can move it between computers. I can do all sorts of things that I want to do. The problem is obviously that, you know, along comes a strong wind and my laptop falls over and now this is gone and now I've lost all my files and lost all my data. So this is why one of the big, um, one of the big movements lately has been towards the cloud. And obviously there are other data related benefits, which including like the fact that it's a real pain in the ass to actually move my data around between all of my devices. Um, and also more and more people hilariously are using more and more computers. So people might have a laptop, they might also have an iPad, and they might also, obviously everyone also has the itty bitty phone. And if you've got something like, let's say you've got some calendar data, I want that calendar data to be available for my phone, I want it to be available for my laptop, I want it to be, it to be available for my desktop. I also want to be able to sync that data between other people. So let's say if I uh, have an appointment with my dad, me and my, count, me and my dad might have an event. Um, and this is shared between both of us. So there's my calendar and dad's calendar. Um, or another example which will come up is say, um, uh, I might want to have a Word document. Um, so like, you know, Google Docs is great for this sort of thing. I might have a document and it's got a bunch of text in it and um, we want to have multiple people all collaborating to work on it together. Um, and we can all edit simultaneously with different cursors in different places. And this is like, this is all really, really useful functionality, which absolutely is not supported by this simple model of having a bunch of files all sitting on a hard disk, which is physically located inside a computer. So we've moved towards the cloud. Um, and we've moved towards the cloud with all of this stuff. And the cloud is great for lots of things, but one of the biggest changes has been applications moving to the cloud. And applications work in a fundamentally different manner. Um, this is all like kind of obvious. I want to get to the thing that's interesting, but first of all, we have to talk about why we're here. Um, so when you use a desktop app, I say like something like Gmail, what actually happens is you've got a browser. So this is, uh, you know, a Chrome, um, looks like a stereotyped. Anyway, using Chrome or something and uh, inside a Chrome tab, you have some browser stuff. So this is Gmail itself with its compose button and a whole bunch of messages, a whole bunch of emails and stuff. Um, but this browser is sitting on my physical computer, but my computer doesn't own any of the data. So all my data actually, obviously, is, is sitting in Google's computers. Um, and this is, you know, giant racks of computers. And these are all sitting somewhere lock, lock, far away. And this is Google's property. Google owns these machines. So unlike in the previous situation where this disk was mine, and I could move the physical data between computers. So if I had data on my laptop, I could move it across to my desktop machine. And all that would require is plugging those computers together and copying the files across. Now Google owns my data in a sense. I mean, it's not that they own the data, it's still my data, it's still my emails. Google isn't gonna go ahead and just like randomly read my emails. But if the NSA comes along and they say, hey Google, could you please give us access to Joseph's email? Then Google can be compelled to just hand that data over. I have no idea. 
And I wouldn't know because in a sense, even though it's my data, my data is sitting on someone else's computers. Um, it was, I think the Free Software Foundation was quoted recently as saying that, uh, that there's no such thing as the cloud, there's just other people's computers. In this sense, all of my data is on someone else's computers. And this is great in lots of ways, right? Obviously, this is really just genuinely convenient. Um, this is supposed to be my laptop here, and my laptop can access Google's data center, and also my phone can access Google's data center, and all of my other devices can access Google's data center. Um, so my iPad, say, and if I've got another machine, I can all access that. And in the same way, if my laptop gets you know, dropped or stolen or lost or whatever, so I lose access to this, because all of my data is inside Google's headquarters, I don't lose access to anything. Um, and Google is responsible for keeping my data backed up, and they know what they're doing better than I do, presumably. So that's great, except obviously for this problem, which is that the NSA has more access to my data than I want them to. And honestly, also Google has more access to my data. One of the things that Google does, and they do this um, very regularly, I mean, this is part of the, you know, the deal with, um, with Gmail, is that Google doesn't have humans read my email, but they certainly have computers read my email. And they read my email and they read your email so that they can make um, advertising you know, so they can do advertising towards me. So they can personalize ads. So I'm going to get some ads, which will be specifically tailored towards the things that appear in the exact emails that I'm writing and reading, which honestly is really creepy. Um, so the other day I was in class and one of my students came up to me and said, oh, I would love to learn more about Siebel Floss programming. Is there any, are there any good material, you know, good, good uh, resources that I can refer to? And I told them, oh, I don't know about online ones. You should have a bit of a Google around. But uh, there's a really, really great book. Um, and this book is like a really great primer to C++. So I did a quick search on Amazon and came up with the Amazon product page for it. Um, I don't know how to do Amazon Smile, but anyway. Um, I showed them the page on Amazon.com. And the very next day, I was browsing Facebook. And sure enough, on Facebook, there was a little banner out on the side for the exact C++ book that I'd done a search for on Amazon the day before. Now, I don't know if Amazon was sharing that data with Facebook. For me, I don't know if they're sharing it to Facebook or if it's just that there are some sort of affiliated advertising partner or what the situation is. But I find that really creepy. I mean, like, I don't know. I use the internet for lots of things that, say, I don't want my employers to find out about. You know, like, if I look up some, like, you know, porn or something, whatever else. What if I were to like look up some raunchy erotica on Amazon? And now is is that information about my my like personal porn preferences? Is that all going to show up on Facebook? Like, does Facebook know net that now? Like, can Facebook will Facebook start using that information to I don't know try and sell me or like say oh Joseph likes this sex toy and say tell it to my friends? Um, like, I mean, this whole thing is really creepy in my mind. It's something that absolutely does not sit right with this model of my data sitting in Google servers and Google having complete control over it. I want to have some way for us to be able to get the functionality and features of this sort of model of me owning my data um, with simple applications, and obviously the application sits on my computer and just talks to the files directly, while still also having all of the benefits of this sort of cloud model where I've got a bunch of different devices, all storing or all, all being able to access and interact with the data that I own without having some like giant shadowy corporate overlord looking at my data itself. So what like what do we do about all of this? And one option is to like move towards decentralization for all of these services. But the problem with decentralization is honestly, it's really, really hard to build a network like Facebook or systems like Facebook with decentralized, fully decentralized systems. So I'm going to propose something a little bit less audacious, which I sort of want to build. And this is the idea of a personal database. I want a personal database. And by personal database, what I really mean is that I want to have some database that's, that is mine. It's, on my computers. It's something that's in my grasp. It's in my control. It's something that I can, I can back up and I can manage and it can be stored in the cloud somewhere. That's fine, as long as it's stored in a machine that I have control over. And if that means that the machine has full disk encryption or it means that it's a machine that sits in my cupboard uh, and you know, is used as a heater during winter, that's kind of okay. The important thing in this sense is that the database that I use for all of this should be something that other people can't read, other people can't access. I know that I can't access it because it's stored on computers that I have control over. And for lots of people, that maybe that means nothing. Maybe it means that the database is just going to be at least stored in someone else's you know, data center. Like if you look at the Google situation, the NSA actually really only needs to ask one person to be able to access the data that they're storing. They just say, hey, Google, can you please tell us everything you know about Joseph? But even if, I mean, even, even if it was as simple as there's some third party that does hosting, and that third party that does hosting manages these like personal databases, then 
we could separate that out from people like Google who run Google Calendar or Google Docs. So what I want is to be able to have sites like these exist, exist in the cloud, but actually they interact with whichever database I've elected. So instead of Google owning the data and running the data, I can run the data and then Google just connects to the database provider that I've specified, which should be pretty simple. There's obviously a few problems with this. One is that um, different applications and different services are going to want to have a lot of control over the schema. Um, there's going to be latency implications. And there's going to be like a bunch of other things that will come up. But yeah, I would love to have this sort of database, a personal database. Um, I'm considering calling it like the web database, a database designed for the web, designed for modern users, for modern applications on the web. And notice designed for modern users, not modern web developers. I want this to be something that is uh, like understandable by the average person in the same way that when I have files on my computer, I've like most people understand these sort of directories. Most people understand Finder with you know all of its eccentricities, um, while also still having all of the benefits that something like a cloud service provides. So yeah, that's what I want to build. So with that in mind, here's like the set of things that I want from it. Um, the first thing is obviously it should be under the user control, user's control. It might make sense to have some like you know host, hosting provider like a default host. So if you, the user doesn't have any personal database themselves, they should be able to store their data with some default provider, which is trusted. Um, the thing I think about for something like this is you know Mozilla Persona. So Persona allowed any anyone to have their own identity providers, which would do like user logins and everything else. But Mozilla also ran their own Persona servers. So if a user didn't have a, like a server specified, then they could just use Mozilla's, um, which is really great. It's going to be able to be like super versatile. Uh, and this is, this is annoying. The reason it needs to be really versatile is simply because, um, because it needs to be able to support a big wide variety of apps. I would ideally like this thing to be able to support, you know, for example, uh, photos, which means it needs a blob store. It needs to be able to, you know, do some like, you know, like relational database type things. Um, it needs to be fast. It needs to be able to support queries. I'm actually considering adopting or like um, fighting for using uh, Facebook's uh, GraphDB for something like this, which might work really well. I think GraphDB has a really nice um, relationship with like a really nice, a bunch of really nice properties around relational data while also being fast and being modern. Um, just using a regular key value store is, would probably work. In fact, I think it definitely would work, except that a lot of application developers would balk at losing access to their SQL stores. Um, although obviously like, you know, if, if a product like, um, like Foundation DB didn't get bought and eaten by Apple, then that might also be a nice option. So a bunch of stuff like this, this is like standard database stuff. And if we're gonna be able to, if we wanna design a database that all different applications should be able to write to, then it's going to need to support some of these features. Other things I want it to be able to do is I want it to be able to do like real time, over the past few years, I've been working on ShareJS. Um, and ShareJS lets you do like distributed real-time operational transform stuff. Um, OT, which lets us you know, effectively make applications where as one user types data, every other user, if they're looking at the same data, will see that, see that update in real time. For a database, the way that I imagine this sort of thing working is that if we've got some, some data, right? So I'm in my web browser and I've got some application running here. And as I type on the keyboard, uh, I'm typing in some field here. And what this is doing is it's actually streaming straight to the database and sending like little operations or sending mutations character by character to the database. And the database is then going to be making modifications internally, storing that, those changes and that change data that I'm writing. And the database should also provide hooks for all of those changes to be streamed to other places. So for example, if I've got my phone open at the time, I should be able to see all those characters be typed on my phone as I type them on my laptop. And likewise, um, maybe it makes sense, or maybe I want to have some uh, other third, like other collaborators. So other people are also collaborator collaboratively editing this document with me. They should be able to stream those operations in as well. Um, and I should be able to also replicate that data out. So if I've got some other store or some other application that is, I, I don't know, like let's say I've got email and I hit the send button, then when I hit that send button, maybe it changes the state of the email to say that this email should be sent. So that email will be sent, like that email will have the state sending and that replicates out to some like email sender uh, worker, which might actually take that email, send it 
of SMTP or whatever, and then update the state on the document to say it's sent. And when that state updates back to sent, that can update and replicate all the way back to my client, and my email can say that now it's been sent. So you can make applications like this. Um, and this is all totally doable with today's technology and today's you know, tools. Um, but yeah, this is the sort of thing that I would love in, in a database. But the important thing obviously though, and I think this is one of the, the sort of most interesting properties of this, is that this is a database that's designed first for users. It's not designed first for applications to be able to do all this cool stuff. It should be the kind of database that instead of like having a really kick-ass you know, set of developer documentation, the most important thing that this database could have is a, a really nice UI. So I should be able to go to my database, like go to the website or whatever that the database hosts, and be able to see all my data and sort it by like application and then click on this and be able to expand it out and see all of the changes that are happening to my database in real time. Um, it's also important obviously for trust reasons to be able to see what individual applications or different clients are doing and what data they're accessing and modifying. And maybe even as well go in here and be able to just make changes directly to the data in the database itself without having to resort to, well actually, honestly there's no way to do that today but without needing the application developers to necessarily have specialized functionality to be able to do simple things like copying or backing up or, um, uh, or making changes to certain settings. There should be a way just directly inside the database itself to be able to make all those changes here. And meanwhile, still giving the application developers enough control over being able to like, edit the schema and everything else. Another really nice property of, an, of a database like this is it would mean that, for example, if I have, I mean, let's say I'm using Google Calendar. Um, so here I've got like my calendar data and this calendar data is accessed by Google Calendar. But remember that obviously Google Calendar, the site inside my browser is gonna access my database. Um, and this database should never, like this data should never hit Google's actual servers. It should just be loaded by the browser itself maybe. Um, but I've got my Google Calendar data sitting inside here. And now what I should be able to do is, well obviously to, for Google Calendar to work, it's gonna upload the schema into my data store. So this is the Google Calendar schema. schema. And obviously I can access that data by just clicking in the web app. But it should, obviously, this, this is a database that I run. So that means this database can provide different APIs and hooks to be able to access the data directly. Google shouldn't really necessarily need to provide an API as long as we have a really nice generic API by which that calendar data can be accessed by other things. Now, since this, um, this database thing might have a web API or something else like that, um, I'm imagining as well that it provides some like OAuth by which I can authorize that Google Calendar has access to the calendar data stored inside my database and only the calendar data stored in my database but I can give access to that data to some other application. I don't know, maybe like um, I'm using an iPhone. I switched to an iPhone and I wanna start using iCal. Now iCal should obviously also be able to OAuth in the same way to the same set of data stored inside my database. And when it does that, iCal should be able to pull in and actually synchronize with the exact same set of data which Google Calendar is using, which would give me two-way sync with calendars, right? And that would essentially be free by just simply using these two different applications and by them both mutually supporting or having compatibility wrappers for the different um, data models. Actually, even if that wasn't the case, even if iCal required or used or didn't support the, the Google format but made its own calendar format, so iCal has its iCal data here and Google Calendar has its own Google Calendar database, because again, remember that we can provide all these hooks. Like, it means that third-party developers could find ways to be able to synchronize and keep these ca calendars in sync purely by like third-party software that I could install on my database or I could use and connect from other machines to my database over the internet. That's the sort of thing that I want to see in a next generation um, database. There's one last feature which I really, really like about this, which is that there's been lots of noise about um, IPFS lately and different ways to do like a distributed web. The idea is that if I've got a web page, then I've got some web page with a bunch of content on it, like let's say a blog. This blog actually has some data or it's got some HTML and CSS which should be able to be distributed between lots of different computers. It means if this site goes down randomly, the data is still accessible via other places. Um, there's a whole bunch of like nice distributed system benefits to this sort of IPFS style thing. But by combining IPFS with some sort of personalized database like this, um, it's possible to be able to build entire applications. You could build an app which is simply HTML and CSS and obviously some JavaScript. And this application itself wouldn't have to have its own database. It wouldn't have to store data in the cloud itself. It doesn't have to, like this application doesn't have to know who I am at all. It could simply be an app that people put out. And when this application gets updated and when it, you know, when it gets run, it just simply connects this application in to the database that I have. And in a sense, I'm providing all of the infrastructure and I'm providing all the cost in actually keeping that database running. Which moves us back to the old style system where we have 
applications running on my machine where the application is connects to the files that I have control over and I can give the application access to those files while still also not sending those files up into someone else's cloud where they can be uploaded by the NSA. So yeah, so that's, that's the sort of thing that I want to build. Um, obviously there's some problems, like there are trust problems here. There's nothing stopping a website from up taking my data and uploading it somewhere else. But I think that, I think that this is a solvable set of problems. This is something that we can approach and we can attack. Obviously, like, this isn't the perfect thing. Um, it'd be really sweet to have like, full end-to-end -end encryption on this database, so I'm the only one with the keys and so on. But honestly, I think for most users, for now, that's probably going to be impractical. Maybe that's something that we could add in later um, when the technology is a little, little bit more advanced. But certainly, I think it would be a great start. Like, fundamentally, I want to build applications, and I want to build applications in the web where different devices can access them. I want my applications to not have to install anything, no, install, no, no installation. I want them to be able to sync up between all my different devices. I want to have my phone. I want to be able to have browsers and native apps on my phone. And I want them to all be able to edit the same data. So edit my data. And I don't want that data to be stored on anyone else's computers. As an application developer, I don't want your data. I just simply don't want it. I don't need it. I don't want to have to store it. I want you to do that. And as a user, I really want to be able to get back in control of all of the data that I'm putting out online. I want my Facebook feed to be mine. So yeah, so that's, that's my plan. Um, and that's the plan for, yeah, for a web native database. This is just obviously still in like, you know, I'm having thoughts about this thing phase. I haven't actually started building anything. I've instead been spending a bunch of time reading up on a million different database technologies to try and figure out how we could build this. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a really promising direction. I think it's a really cool piece of tech to have. Um, and I think it would make all of our lives a lot better online. So yeah, thanks for watching.